there's no silver bullet to success in startup and you can't fix price success. So you'd have people saying, okay, this is the idea, come and build it uh, and make sure it's built with this much cost uh, and in this much time. Um, and more often than not, it never happens that way. And welcome to another episode of Behind the Screens with me, David Hart, my partner in crime, Mark McDermott. Hello. And this episode, we're joined by Dr. Carlos Saba. Welcome, doc- Dr. Carlos Saba. <laughs> <laughs> I really should. I, I should have had second thoughts about putting that up on there. But yes, it is Dr. Carlos Saba. Thank you very much for having me on here. <laughs> no, I am pleasure. super excited. Yeah. What's, no, what's up, Doc? <laughs> okay, yeah, that just lost us some viewers. All right. <laughs> well, we, you should know that we, so we've known Carlos since, well, I think I probably met you in 2002. You might have yeah, been a year earlier. Two, 2002, 2003, long time. Long time ago. And actually, you, you look exactly the same as you did 20 years ago. You haven't aged. Have you got any gray hair? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, you can see, I, I try and shave it off when I can. Uh, and it's usually up my nostrils. Okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, it's a better place for it to live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's just growing everywhere. So there we go. Damn it. It's a, a distinguished look, I hear. Actually, all white is the thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. What we're going, that's what we're looking to get to. Yeah, I just, I need, a few more yeah, I just need another like. All we need to do is miss a couple of like quarter targets, and I should yeah. go white. Or well, maybe, uh, <laughs> or maybe do another startup. Let's do another startup. Yeah, 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 Raise yeah, money yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe a nice uh, consumer startup. Should we start like a social media platform, something like that? That, yeah. that should pretty much uh, guarantee an early death. Yeah. <laughs> well, what that sounds like a product there. If you hair. want to look mature and wizard- wizened, just do a startup. Yeah. 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 We'll give you one. <laughs> and if you, if you don't, you should do a happy startup. Let's just see what I did there. Oh, segue. Nice. So This guy. This guy. Uh, Professional. Yeah. So we we used to work with Carlos uh, at an, uh, an agency, and then we I, I think all three of us left around about the same time. Me and Mark and Luke went off to do Cogent. Mm. Carlos, it was Spook Studio, wasn't it? The name of your design agency. Um, but interestingly, we've both left the world of consultancy behind and gone our different ways. We've obviously gone into product, and Carlos and his uh, his partner Lawrence have um, started a company. Uh, called the Happy Startup School, and they're also behind uh, the uh, event called Altitude, which I think you're about to, you're jetting off tomorrow to, to go to. So thanks very much for fitting this in. You must be crazily busy the day before you're about to jet off and do do this big uh, this big thing. But I mean, maybe you could give us a little bit more of a background about what the Happy Startup School is, and and more specifically what Altitude is, and and we can uh, we can start riffing from there. Cool. Thank you. Oh, I, I love telling the story. It's just the trick is trying to make it different each time so I don't get bored. Um, so yeah, like we were, we were at the agency together. Um, and after that, I kind of had this need to not go into uh, an agency like that again. Uh, I wanted to really work. Uh, I think the thing is, was working with people I liked, uh, I like you guys, uh, on product projects I wanted to work on. Uh, and also have a kind of a relationship with the client. I kind of had a challenge of just always being like one step away. Uh, and Lawrence was a designer at the time. Uh, we'd been to school together. So Lawrence and I have known each other since we were about six or seven years old. And we've kind of serendipitously found ourselves in the same industry. He was design. I was doing development. We thought, well, we could do this together. So we just started up from our bedrooms. Uh, I, I kind of left, when I left the, the agency where we were together, I thought, right, Okay, uh, let's uh, see how it goes with freelance. And then working with Lawrence, we partnered on a few projects. And over time, we thought, actually, why don't we just make this more formal? We moved down to Brighton uh, and just started growing it from there. And it, it got to a nice size. There's about six of us. It's it it kind of the size that we, we quite enjoyed. Uh, we had an office near the beach. Um, we were working more and more with entrepreneurs and startups, so kind of doing more platform and um, app development. And... And it was enjoyable, it was fun, but the challenge was with, with, and you guys will know this, that there's no silver bullet to success in startup and you can't fix price success. So you'd have people saying, okay, this is my project, this is the customer, well, actually, not even this guy, this is the idea, come and build it uh, and make sure it's built with this much cost uh, and in this much time. Mm-hmm. And more often than not, it never happens that way. 
Mm. So quite often they'll, 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 and you'll have this brilliant idea and then they'll change it. And then by the time you actually deliver it, you're going, oh, that's like two thirds of, of really what it should be. But or, or they'll have spent all of their money on the MVP and realize that actually uh, that's not what the audience wanted anyway. Uh, but then they come back to you and say, hey, could you just kind of rebuild that, but this time for free? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. And it's, and it's always a really hard challenge of managing expectations because they, you know, they want to conquer the world, but potentially for that much money. And also with a very fixed idea of what success could look like. Uh, and so we ne- we had this, and one of the you know you're talking about building the MVP and actually realizing no one wants it and spending a lot of money. We had like a client spend about th- dropped the thirty grand on this project that we spent about six months on, and in the end, um, he didn't actually approach one of the key people who's going to you know key customers about whether they would pay him ever any money on this, and realize at the end of the project it was never going to fly. And that was that, that classic lean startup, kind of test your assumptions as early as possible. So with that in mind, we needed to actually educate uh, for our peace of mind in terms of how can we run a business when we're always trying to like argue with customers about what, what should be in and what should be out. How can we educate these people? So we needed the school for startups. Uh, but the thing about for us was like it wasn't just about the money. It's actually we wanted to we want to enjoy our work. There was something more than just creating a profit. And there was about the purpose and the passion and the people we work with. And so for us, it was like, OK, it's a startup school. Let's let's make it a happy startup school. And at the time, we had no idea what it was. All it was was a name and a manifesto. This is what we believe. This is what it's called. Uh, and then within, I think, three months of this thing, it was, just, it was just this manifest that we put online and you could sign up with Twitter or Facebook or your email. And we had about a thousand signups without doing much work, we we're just sharing it. And we thought, okay, there's something here. Uh, and so we started doing workshops. And at the time we were reading The Lean Startup and Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, the sort of yes. uh, CEO of Zappos. And this whole idea, right, company culture, make happy employees, then you get happy uh, what, customers, happy customers, good business. And so that was that whole, that was the, the starting point where we thought, oh, that's where the happy startup stuff idea could come from. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then what we found more and more, our first workshop was above a pub in Farringdon and we had so many randoms come there. And after doing that several times, we started to find more and more people that they wouldn't, it wasn't just about the business and understanding of the lean startup stuff. And it wasn't necessarily about corporate culture or turning culture. It was actually getting in tune with what you really wanted and understanding what it was that really motivated you to actually push through the hard stuff. And so over time, it evolved. We, we started doing online courses. This is that classic thing of just trying anything and seeing what sticks. Um, we, so we did the workshops. We then did our first summer camp, which was in Hyde Park, and we had about 80 people attend. And it was one of those things. We had no idea or what was going to happen there. Uh, and, it, and we, we were trying to kick people out at the end of the day because they just wanted to hang around and chat. So it felt like we'd hit a nerve there. We then did an online course about kind of building your happy startup. And I think we had about a uh, hundred people buy it the first time round. I, I remember we were selling it for around about $150 a pop. And it was like, it was that one of those bells go, whoa, we, we, we just create this course, get kind of more or less 15 grand there with with just us talking about what we do which is like okay there's again another signal that there's something there awesome. and so over time <laughs> it kind of evolved to try to build a community and then we started doing retreats that's wow. amazing and so when did that begin what year did that begin uh, the startup school the happy startup school roughly uh, 2012 was actually what no t- i think november 2011 was when it was named uh, 2000 and what was it 2012 2013 I think was our first ever summer camp mm-hmm. and so it was around 2012 2013 that was the slow awareness building the reason I ask is because um and I, I might be misinterpreting the, the I think happy is an interesting word because it, it, it it's a uh, it's a word everyone understands, and then if you really dig into it, it actually means a lot of different things. But it, you know, if you look at kind of, for example, that in the last couple of years, I think, but only the last couple of years, we've been talking more about mental health, uh, particularly mental health within startups and the loneliness and isolation and not being able to talk about it uh, because you know you have to be a superhero founder and all that shit. Um, I mean, I just you you mentioned Tony Shea, and he was obviously his happiness was was certainly about great company culture, but also about happy customers. 
but um, I was wondering, you know, is, is was part of that happiness also about 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 mental health, like, yeah, and 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 that was obviously because great company culture is also there, but there's this elephant in the room about, you know, it's bloody hard, and for most people, it doesn't work out very well. Uh, it, it was that because uh, I just think it's quite you're kind of ahead of your time a bit there. Yeah, at the beginning, we weren't. It wasn't. It wasn't that clear. It was more intuitive because for myself and Lawrence, it was very much about we didn't want essentially we didn't want the stress you know we knew that okay doing work uh, building a business in that way wasn't going to work for us because we 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 intuitively knew that that wasn't something that that um aligned or we had our strengths in or gave us energy and so while it wasn't explicitly said it was very much it was a a, a subliminal thing and while we hooked onto the whole company culture thing actually over time what we've looked at more what we've realized the core of it is really about how do you uh, keep that you know how, how do you keep that sense of uh, the, the energy the and you talk about mental health and mental I, I, I totally appreciate the mental health thing I think sometimes it isn't it's, it's also about just uh, um, when we talk about happiness talk about uh, alignment and just feeling that you're in the right place and you're doing the right thing. Because I think as a founder, what I get and I talk to a lot of people is like just so many pro either opportunities, priorities, things that pe you need to do. And that just anxiety of knowing, you know, not having enough time to do it all. How, how do you cope with that? And, and that's just even if you're mentally strong. What's more if there's other pressures on you and there's challenges? So... So yeah, I think now it's evolved over time, and I think we we kind of rode with that crest as well. That it's very much about I think founders will flourish when they are able to really understand themselves better. And there's this idea that I've uh, learned recently about the law of the lid, where an organization can only go as far as the founder has traveled. This is whether spiritually, mentally, professionally, because they're the person who's at the forefront. And anyone who's further than that will either leave or create conflict because this person's ego or this person's ability to, to do stuff is the person that's kind of keeping people back. Mm. So I think there's very much this idea of not only just maintaining our mental well-being, but also flourishing and, and really digging deep into what's really driving us that can help organizations work better. And so how, how do people, how do, how do you sort of lift the lid as it were? Like how do you, how, how is that growth, that personal growth happen? Because presumably it's not you know, you know, them turning up to the office 20 minutes earlier or something or you know, doing uh, you know, better reporting on their KPIs. It's presumably a much more intimate sort of self-awareness growth. Maybe it's nothing to do with work and it's more to do with what you do with your spare time. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing, <laughs> yeah, but how, yeah, how do you no, help people I, um, get there? So a couple of things sprang up for me when you're, when you're saying that. Is, um, so one thing I, I, rem I, rem I remember someone telling me, or hearing it secondhand, uh, someone saw, talking about the Happy Startup School, um, and he says, they don't, people, they don't teach people to disrupt business models, they just disrupt founders. <laughs> like, that's brilliant okay yeah. i hope that's on your homepage. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and that's because it, it comes down to actually digging deep into um one element that i i've discovered is that we are all triggered uh to risk by certain situations and sometimes we don't know why we're triggered and so we either build up barriers react really badly so whether it's having a conversation a negotiation trying to learn something new trying to do something new when we get triggered and we don't understand where that trigger is coming from, that then hampers our ability to progress and learn. So part of it I'm discovering is also kind of understanding, all right, understanding our emotions, why they come up, um, and what they tell us about what's not being met as our, our needs as people. And so some of us have maybe needs for recognition. And so we're always out there, we're talking, we're being quite flamboyant, but actually there's a deep this deep need for recognition has come from somewhere and this is where it gets a bit deep and a bit and very challenging for some people it's like actually it's part of my identity but it's also come from maybe a past experience that i haven't really tackled and do people open up in a group scenario around that it, that seems like something you'd really want to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion about and maybe kind of you know like an afternoon sort of thing is that something as in a group scenario are people do people open up about what those 
those deeper needs are? Not, I, I wouldn't say to that level. And uh, so the way I look at what we do, because I think, you know, some stuff that needs, you need to go deep and you need, you need to work with someone who can actually hold that space and maybe as a professional, depending on how deep you want to go. One way that I look at what we do as a happy startup school is we like open a door and show people what's inside. And then it's up to them to step through. So it's less about, okay, let's sit down and let's go through your shit right now. It's more about let's have a conversation. Let's have a vulnerable conversation where we can share a bit more about not so much what's great about our businesses and what's in our lives, but actually, you know, we've got some challenges and there's this and this is what's really going on. And then see how that gets people aware that actually when I share that and I don't feel shame around sharing that, then I'm able to either open up more or just think a bit more about what's going on for me. Is that, is Altitude, how, how is Altitude kind of, why is it given a different name to the Happy Startup School? Is it, is it a different, is it looking to achieve a different thing or is it, is it an extension of the Happy Startup School? Um, so I think there's two things there. Uh, one, um, it was a spontaneous naming. We, we went out to see Jack Hubbard who, who lives out in the French Alps and he talked to our second summer camp. Um, and he had this idea for the Dream Valley and it, it was like this adventure playground for founders. And, this, and he had this whole graphic done. Um, we, we went out to see him because he said, oh, that sounds interesting because we always thought about doing retreats. Mm. Um, and we're walking up a mountain and we're trying to think of, yeah, it'd be good to get a bunch of people out there because we'd love to just come out and just, and, and take time off basically just shut yeah. off from the busyness um and i think we were thinking it's about attitude and we're in the alps and i was just like altitude and it was just one of those okay and then within we got back within three hours lawrence put together a landing page we kind of just put some pictures together and we stuck it online and yeah. this is kind of the way we do a lot of stuff it just goes up there and we see what what comes back and so that name stuck by accident rather than design yeah so i'm um, um- just tell us about a little bit more about what Aptitude is and what it's, it's trying to achieve. It's so obviously, I'm, I'm guessing it's kind of an extension of what you've just been saying. Um, but Yes, yes and no. I think when I, if I explained Aptitude in the way I explained it before, I think no one would want to come. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, I don't want to go there and start on the side of a mountain. Yeah, yeah. It's a cult. That's next stage. When I get to that kind of Tony Robbins um, level of, of dealing with people's shit, then that's fine. No. For me, and I, I've, having done this several times, I think the key thing is that people just want some space uh, and they want to get away. But, they, you know, you can go away on your own. But there's something also about going away with another group of people who, who have either similar experiences or similar intentions to an inspirational place. Yeah, because the way you, did, you described it, to, well, the way I sort of, when I was reading about it, it didn't seem like... I'm sh- this is probably the wrong way to say it. It didn't seem super organized in as much as at nine o'clock, you will be having a workshop on this. And at 10 o'clock, you'll be doing this. It seems a lot more kind of free form than that. Is that, is that, is, is that right? Yeah. That is on purpose. And it is, and it's the way we do our summer camp as well in terms of it's, it's, so it goes back to why we have summer camp. And maybe that's another way of explaining it is that we used to go to events and, and conferences uh, and they would be full of content because that's where the value is apparently. But all the conversations that we had that were meaningful and all the connections we made were in the in-between bits. Yeah. The, what was called the campfire moments, whether it's in the coffee, uh, the foyer, having a coffee at the cloakroom. It was those in the blue. <laughs> but those little moments where you're not just absorbing content, you're just having a conversation. So for us, it's actually the, the value is in the space. And the value also... Um, I think the other element of the, you know, the unstructured bit is that our lives are so structured already and we, we try and control everything. And I'm very guilty of this as well. I want to know what's the plan, what's the strategy, where we're going, how does it work? And if you look at this more and more, it's actually it's being able to react in the moment and also to be, to let loose of that structure a bit allows ideas to flow a lot better and allows us to see things a little more, much more clearly. Mm. So, so yeah, it, it's on. It's structureless on purpose. This is this is a very small example of experiencing that from our. So we every year, well, I say every year, we've only done it once, but we're doing it again this year. We fly everyone because we're distributed around the world. We fly everybody together, uh, and we call it Screen Cloud Together. And the last one we did was in actually in the mountains in in Poland, 
Uh, and we did quite a lot of, we did some structural, stru more structured stuff as well, which I think we needed to do. But probably the, the day that we got the most value out of was when we just said, right, we're going to go for a walk up the mountain to a kind of restaurant and then walk back again. And <laughs> it was, it was, you know, because people just got to talk to each other in a way that they wouldn't ordinarily, you, you end up just walking next to someone who's walking at the same pace as you, who you might never have really spoken to or e even really, mm. you know, acknowledged before. Um, and that, that was with 35 people. This time it'll be probably like 70 people, um, which will probably make it even more interesting, the kind of connections that people will make. But mm. it, it was definitely interesting. I think that when we did a survey, that universally got a really good response, that people really enjoyed the trek up the side of the mountain. Even though the first mile was like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was planned on Google Maps. And I think the hint should have been that it was a 10K walk, that the uh, optimal time on Google Maps was something like a five hours. And yeah, like, and I was like... How I, is 10K possible I was like, I was just five hours? It's like... I just, have they, have, have, is this for the elderly? I know. Or I was like, I, I, no, I, it's because it's like that, mate. I'm going to see if anyone. I, I was like, I'm going to see if anyone wants to come on a run with me. I'll just run it, 10k. I, th I think. And then when thought, I, there's absolutely no way you could have run. I it, think right? our staff, especially the new ones, thought maybe it was like a, a, a test, like the SAS, yeah. to see if we could break them. Yeah. And only the strongest survive. Yeah. Um, no, it's just poor planning. <laughs> but you know, actually. But there's something in that it. though, because even if it's challenging, or if you know, we, we've done stuff and we're going uh, some of our hikes and altitude, we like sideways rain and it's miserable sometimes well it, some aspects of it is miserable but actually that shared experience that shared challenge and toil and i, I remember you've done tough mother several times haven't you um, mark and it's like that that's what bonds people as well it's amazing what that does to people mm. yeah yeah no i mean especially like the, 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 those kind of tough mother events i mean they're not as tough as people sort of say but but actually it, it forces you to what's quite I like about that and I, I regularly run now with a friend of mine we do it sort of annually is like you know so for example some of the walls you know are genuinely pretty high there's, I mean unless you're kind of built like a spring you couldn't get up there on your own and then if there's just two of you um, then obviously uh, like I can lift him up uh, but I'm quite a lot bigger than him and so when it's his turn to lift me up he we usually have to kind of basically ask a stranger otherwise you're you're stuck there um, and it, it's it's kind of amazing it's actually normally as you say like the uncomfortable bits the you see some people having a panic attack about like um, some of the heights or going into confined spaces and you know the whole emphasis of that event is not about the time on the course it's about your time on the course mm. and and what you get out of that by helping people and not by racing around and if you see someone struggling or needing a bit of a, a moment like you know you're you're kind of obliged to sort of help uh, and it is a really it's a really good thing um to do and i think yeah that's, that's a sort of example of that and uh and, that, and that's why we did it on that on that together um you know, we and we want to do that again, and it obviously gets more complicated to do it the bigger it gets. But there's, yeah, like you say, there's something about unstructured. I mean, you could even say this with children, right? You know, let children have unstructured, unstructured play, and just watch the creativity and watch probably real bonding. But if it's like a really, for, I mean, I'm not a parent, but like I'm just guessing. For me, the idea of a forced play date where you just pick two kids randomly and say, you will now be friends for half an hour. And like whilst, you know, the parents chat and I just think, what? Like, this is almost like kind of like trying to breed horses or something. It's kind of weird. Oh, sorry, that's... Okay, I'm going, I'm going in a very, very bad place there. Tony, edit it, edit it. Okay. That's got to be the, the pull-out line for, but, the, for the advert. But, but you know what I mean? It's almost like you're kind of social engineering. Oh, this will be good because then our families will... Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm yeah, going to... Yeah. My whiz kids, I'll ask a credit. Yeah. Uh, the um, <laughs> that wasn't on film. <laughs> yeah. The uh, what was I going to say? The um, uh, so so what do people? What's Shit. the idea? Like at the end of it, what do people <laughs> go away with? What's the? What, if you go on this thing and you come away, is it is it? Oh, I made some great connections, or is there anything sort of tangible, like an ROI almost that people are expecting to get? Not or, breeding. Not breeding. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> right. There's no ROA. I think <clears throat> this is the th and this is the challenging thing about it. And it's only I think the people who come to it really know that what they're going to get out of it because it's very personal. Um, you know, simple things you'll get away. You'll go to the mountains. So a lot of people they just want to be in the mountains. Um, you're going to meet some really interesting people. And you'll make some some lifelong friends. Yes. Yeah. Um, but people come down closing their businesses, starting new businesses. Um, changing relationships, uh, having collaborations. There's no, there's no kind of 
you do this and you'll get this from altitude. It's very much you're creating a space for things to emerge. And, and that will depend on, again, is how much you put into it, how much you let go uh, and then realize, actually, this is what I really needed. And you, you, what happens is everyone who comes will get what, will get what they need. It's just will be different for each person. And just to ask an awkward question, have people come on and just totally not got it and not got into it and just resisted throughout it? Our first one, we had a little bit of that. Um, there was still, the way I hear it, the term I've, I've heard it being put is still very much in their head. Mm -hmm. so still very thinking mode, still trying to rationalize and, and order and structure stuff. And I'm very much like that as well. Um, but then the more and more we've got to understand what makes a good altitude, uh, the more we've understood who should come. And also the clearer we've been. I think the more bold we've been about, like you said, unstructured, mm -hmm. the more likely the right people turn up because it's a filter for people who, who don't want that. And that yeah. must have been, like the very first time you did it, that must have been terrifying thinking, because the, the natural thing would be to say, okay, this is how you do a retreat. Let's go, you know, Google. Let's have a look at some other hmm. retreats and copy that to actually sort of say, right, we're not going to do that. We're going to throw, rip the rule book up. We're going to charge people thousands of pounds to come out and, you know, sit on the side of a, of a mountain and or whatever. see what happens. And see what happens. Like, <laughs> were, were, you, were you kind of confident that it would all work out fine? Or were you slightly terrified that you'd, you'd made a, an error of judgment? I think it's great, by the way. But yeah, I, I think I would be terrified. It's an interesting one, that. Following a and, and the thing that springs up for me is this, this the, the balance between researching and and you know working out what is it what's the need and then going with your gut um and i, I would defer to lawrence because it was lawrence who's really pushed this yeah. um and it was very much a need you know a need we he knew very much and i've come to realize over time how powerful and how um how needed it is to be out a, in having space for you to think, but also be around like-minded people uh, and where there isn't a pressure to, to, to perform and to create. And also, you know, more and more that we've done our work, how creating that, that space allows things to emerge. You know, one of the things that we do, while, while we don't have structured programs, people come with stuff that they can share. Yeah. So we had last uh, last time we had a guy called Graham Olcott who who's, who just wrote a book about uh, nutrition and he shared his thoughts about nutrition. We had a, a woman who's a leadership coach. She talked about uh, trauma and leadership. We have a mindfulness coach who's come and, and then the people come with their own skills and they create the content that's needed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of in answer to your question about that first time round, we we did it with our families. So we brought our kids out. We were very clear. And also, I think the other benefit we had is a lot of people kind of knew who we were through the Happy Startup School. Yeah. So there was, a, there was a trust there that this would be good, whatever happened. Yeah. And do you think there's sort of lessons that companies can learn around, you know, things like our, the retreat that we do every year. Obviously, it's not, you know, it's more of a, mm. it's more of a, I don't know what you'd call it, really. Offsite, we call off, it. Yeah, yeah, an offsite. It is an offsite. And, they, and, and offsite's increasingly... Uh, requirement as more companies are distributed yeah. you know uh, distributed teams is now fairly normal and so you've got like randoms like us trying to pull this offsite off you we, know yeah and just kind of making it up as we go along and yeah I, I think actually just having done that first one we learned a lot about uh, what yeah what worked and what was what people were less happy about or what you know the weird things that people kind of get you know the things people get hung up on yeah. and the things they don't yeah exactly <laughs> i was just happy everyone got home alive and got fed i mean yeah. <laughs> they got from the airport yeah, there I was sure. like, liability insurance is yeah. <laughs> but do you do you see what you're doing as a model that other organizations could kind of copy or or actually no just keep it yeah <laughs> get off that's uh, that's well I, well to, to the latter i'm happy to share all of this as much as possible i think it's much needed um uh, I am confident in that because not everyone can hold a space. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it's very much these kind of events, particularly when it isn't very structured, you know, and you're trying to um, to not make it too rigid. There's a, you need to have a trust in that, and you need to also be able to hold people in that as well. So there's a there's a certain level of like you know we're talking about the law of the lid. I believe there's as someone who's holding that space, you need to have had you know done some work around not getting too anxious if things aren't going the way you want them to go, if you see what I mean. 
Uh, ironically, we're, we're working with a company in the US who does kind of these retreats off sites for companies like Spotify and, um, and, yeah, and Nike and things like that. And we're partnering with them because they want to take the idea of altitude, but how can we apply it to company off sites? Uh, I would say one of the key things is you've got to be very intentional about what this thing is. If, you know, what, why are we here in terms of, are you here just to say hi and, uh, you know, get together? Are you here to do strategizing? Are you here to, I don't know, work out who you need to kick out? <laughs> but is that, is, you've got to be really clear about the intention. And then there's, I think there's a size challenge as well. I think when you start getting to those numbers of 70, not everyone's going to, you know, well, you've got to design it in a way where everyone can work, you know, meet each other. And what I've discovered with running online communities, also doing large events, um, small groups work a lot better than trying to get everyone in a large group talking to each other. So there's, there's a safety in smaller groups that allows people to express themselves. Well, also like in a larger group setting, the natural extroverts will, will, will kind of uh, come to the fore and the others will just sort of retreat and shy, shy back. So, yeah. you know, and actually like it's, you, it's almost like the people you need to get the most out of that kind of uh, time together is, isn't the, the people whose voices you hear on Slack all the time or the ones who are giving presentations because that's what they love to do. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, shouldn't be demeaned in any way like it's great you've got to have that mix and those people who love to be sort of you know sort of forefront but then you've also got to remember there's those quiet ones who who need their uh, an opportunity for them to come sort of out of themselves a bit and and, and take things away from it it's it's really hard mm. like it's really i mean i'll be honest like um on the uh on the offsite that we the first one we ever did i mean i actually if I'm honest, didn't really enjoy it that much because it, there were moments, but I, I was just full of anxiety the whole time about like everything from like food to like, is everyone being involved properly to like, has everyone even like what's going on? And, and also to be honest, the relentless questions, like what's the plan for that? What's the plan for this? And that could be anything like, what's the plan for the exit of the company or what's the plan for dinner? Like, uh, like and that could have come at you in, in the space of a minute mm. and you're also going up this crazy hill. But like, <laughs> but I, like, so I think I've got a lot to learn about how the next one goes. And I think one of the things that I want to include more of in the next time is the opportunity for people to have space on their own and not be in a group constantly because for, for certain types of personalities like my own, I find it like, draining even if it's fun i find it exhausting mm -hmm. yeah no there's I th and like with that first altitude um one of the guys who came actually ended up spending half of it in his room writing a book right because that's what he needed and yeah. he ended up finishing his book on on the retreat yeah. and so, was, he had permission to do that you i mean yeah. not that you had to give him permission but the fact he wasn't feeling like oh my god I'm, oh, i should yeah. really be doing this i'm you know that's that's uh, that's that's really it's a powerful, very yeah. subtle thing to communicate yeah. that effectively and to let people not feel guilt for that yeah like because imagine for the first couple of hours even though he, his mind or body was craving that isolation he was probably laden with a bit of guilt of like i've just come to the alps with this group and we're supposed to be doing things sort of even unstructured but we are theoretically not supposed to all sit in our room that's presumably not the intention um and how did you actually get him to feel accept that or was he just kind of like oh fuck it this is what's going to happen anyway so let's go yeah I, for us it was you know we asked if he wanted to join but he was very clear that he wanted to write his book and we said that's fine and it was, and it was yeah I did, there wasn't any particular design around it it was just there was and again it comes out this was the intention you know the way you, we phrase it it's your week you know your week to do with the way you want and we are, we're creating this space and we're creating, you know, we have certain organized uh, trips and activities, but, you know, it's, it's really up to the people there to, to do what they want. Hmm. Cool. It's fascinating. Well, I know, I know you, you're kind of under a bit of time pressure because you're yeah. flying off tomorrow, but I just want one, one last question, if, if we may. Yeah, uh, is, is um, what, where, where's the future? What's the, what's the next sort of two, three, four years look like for Happy Startup and the Aptitude uh, conferences? retreats so the five-year plan yeah <laughs> but well, really yeah. really structured yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you could go through every 12 months and give us a pnl for that yeah i think i have um i have a an envision of a way it could feel um you know the the big thing for us is 
we're creating a space and a community for people who want to do business differently. And there is a very traditional way of doing business and there are very set rules around structures and, and laws and regulations and, and approaches. Um, and there's also a lot of people out there who are really alienated by that because they don't think that that's the, they, you know, it's not something they, they can work with as, as, as part of the way they are built. So for us, it's, it's trying to create a space for alternative ways of looking at business keeping the fundamentals there, you know, still got to spend or oh, spend less money than you make. So that's always useful. Um, I think another thing I heard is like, you know, the money helps you promote the message. So if the money isn't there, then the message isn't going to go anywhere. But um, yeah, I, I have this vision for me of it's, there's a physical space and it's very much embedded in nature and it's very much a collaborative effort where we have experts in, in their field, whether it's meditation, whether it's business planning, whether it's scaling, whether it's, you know, but they have the same intention to work together and look at business in a more holistic way rather than just let's get these numbers going in that direction full stop, no matter what. Yeah. Um, and then, and that being a community. And that for me is like that, this is the journey I'm on at the moment trying to understand what that looks like in terms of a, future but it is very much it's going to be embedded in community which means it's very going to be very collaborative it's going to be a, a case of looking at how the business model works in terms of a community and there's there's some you know standard ways of looking at it but i i love i'm inspired by an organization in the new zealand called Enspiral, and it's it's a very collaborative collection of uh, designers developers uh but it's a very flat structure and, and there's something in that that appeals to me. I don't know how it works. Um, practically, I don't know. But I, well, the thing I have a gut feeling of, it will work if every person within the organization does some work on themselves. Because this whole thing about transparent salaries and flat structures and no hierarchies will, I believe, always fail when ego gets in the way. Sure. But when you have people in an organization like that who really understand what enough is for them, you know, I don't necessarily want the same amount of money of that person because I know happiness for me is this and I'm happy with that. But I think the challenge is always with, with unhappiness and is the con contrast and comparing to other people. And that's where, when you're in an organization that says we're going to be a lack, flat structure and everyone's going to be, you know, the same. I don't think that works if individuals in there still held by that sense of, okay, oh, uh, they're getting that and I'm not getting it. So that's not fair. And so you start creating politics around that. So I have, that's the, that's kind of the holy grail of like, how can I be in an organization or community? Because again, it's this idea of this not only, I don't have to own the whole thing. I want to be part of a group of people trying to make this work better. And how do we create an ecosystem that works that way? And then ultimately that's the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ah, so awesome. small plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we want everyone oh. to be happy. That's the yeah, well, yeah. it's a you it's know a what? Like, it, when when they are good things happen. Yeah, you know, just got to keep believing it and not not be a slave to just growth, growth at all costs. Because yeah, or well, bad things happen even when you get the growth that you feel that you deserved or wanted. I mean, you know, and then. And yeah. then, a, then a lid comes off either way. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and it might not, not have very nice things in it. This model, I uh, oh, this story that I come put the sort of sort of just try to use. That's trying to use my um, my Dr. Carlosness, which is my PhD in physics, and trying to apply that to this whole startup thing. And it's this whole model of the sun. You know, so this is the idea of the sun. How does the sun work? So basically, it's a big ball of gas, yeah, like most founders. And what it is is it creates a lot of gravitational pressure that pushes all the gas molecules and atoms into the center. So you got at the center, the pressures and temperatures are so high that hydrogen atoms fuse together to create helium. And you have this, you know, Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. When hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms turn into helium, they lose a little bit of mass. And that mass turns into energy, which pushes out. So you've got this image of like this guy, big ball of gas, loads of pressure pushing inwards and energy pushing outwards. And then that stabilizes and you have a sustainable sun. So I think about a founder and essentially what you have is you have the pressures of the organization, you have the pressures of the market, and they're all pushing in on you. And 
what you have as a fan is your own needs. You know, what is it that you need? What gives you energy? What lights your fire? What, and that's the kind of thermonuclear fusion within you that pushes outwards. And so when you get your needs met, they can then counterbalance the needs of the organization and, and the business you're trying to create. Then you have sustainability. And talking to your you know, point about mental well-being is that when you forget what those needs are and you essentially start playing to someone else's script, at some point that energy then reduces and, and with the sun you go black hole or supernova. Those are the two things. Either you just compress and you know, bad things happen or you say, fuck it, I'm leaving this, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. And so for me, that's the whole thing. It's like, actually, you know, when you're talking about altitude and needs and, you know, this kind of what does it mean to, to do that interactive work? Like when you get to know yourself a lot better and what really makes you tick, then you can then line that up against the stuff you want to do so that you get that kind of dynamic uh, uh, equilibrium. Mm. And that's the thing for me that's, that's really fascinating about what it means for founders to talk about this stuff. Yeah, it's a great analogy. You beautifully explained. Yeah. I think I don't think we'd be able to uh, I couldn't put it better add any more than that. I think it's awesome to see you again, Carlos. It's been too Oh long. no, really grateful. It's lovely to see you guys. I hope to see you in person soon. And as you know, I love talking about this stuff. And yeah, I'm going to have to get you guys on 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 my little fledgling, lot less uh, polished and produced podcast. But I'd love to talk about your story as well. We'd love to do awesome. it. Yeah, great. Cheers, man. Okay, okay. well, well look, thanks uh, a lot. And good luck with the good trip. Good luck. Yeah, I'm sure it's sure to be a success. Yes. And now to pack. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Brilliant. Thank you, Carlos. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. And we'll put URLs and stuff in show notes so people can check it out and find out more. Amazing. Thank you very much. All right, dudes. Cheers, Take care. Keep rocking. Thank you.